uh, and uh, be taught by you through your word. I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth might be used for your glory and your honor and that truth might be proclaimed. And Lord, I pray that any kind of misleading or false words might be might fall by the wayside and not be remembered. But Lord, we know that your word does not return to you void, but goes out and achieves that for which you send it. And we pray, Lord, that that might be taking place in our midst today. Lord, work in our hearts. Open our eyes to behold Christ. Open our ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. And Lord, help us to take hold of Jesus by faith. And so come into your presence with joy and thanksgiving and find rest. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, kids, I think Anastasia is a great name. Have, have you heard of that name before? Yeah? Does anybody have any friends or called Anastasia? No? Uh, our baby's almost due in a, in a few weeks. Do you reckon we should call our baby girl Anastasia? Yes? <laughs> I haven't talked to, that, to Laura about that, so it's a bit of, bit of a news flash for her. <clears throat> now, do you know what Anastasia means? And this is, a, I'm not, I'm guessing mo- many of the kids wouldn't know, or, but anybody, does anybody know what Anastasia means? Resurrection, that's exactly right. Resurrection. It's, a, it's almost a direct rip-off of the Greek word anastasis. Anastasis. So that's a word that turns up in our passage today. So you can, you can say, I learned a Greek word today, anastasis, which means resurrection. And in our passage today, Jesus uses this word to describe himself. He, he's, he's not using the feminine name, but he's, use, he's saying, I am anastasis. I am resurrection and he will resurrect his people what does resurrection mean yeah say say again bring somebody back to life yes that's exactly right resurrection is about bringing somebody back to life and jesus has said he will bring people back to life in fact he is the source of life He will bring his people back to life. He'll bring his followers back to life. But Jesus also tells us how we can be his followers. Jesus says, The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And that's great news for us. That's great news for kids because kids can believe too. Kids, you can believe in Jesus and never die. Not in the sense that you might experience a physical death in the future, but Jesus says, even though they die, whoever believes in me will never die. They will live. That's great news. For us, as we work our way through the book of John, we are seeing time and time again how the purpose that John wrote the book for is, is, is all the way through. He says in, in later on in John that uh, the book was written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and by believing have life in his name. And so we've been seeing that pop up time and time and time again all the way through the book of John. John just keeps showing us how Jesus is the Messiah, why you should believe in him and is really pressing it home. And we're now entering the first half of the book of John is basically all narrative it's all kind of stories about things that were happening with Jesus yes there's teaching mixed in with that but it's all kind of leading up to where we're headed now in terms of this resurrection of Lazarus and we're entering a a bit of a change in the book of John because soon it's going to this is kind of a, a climax point and then the book of John is going to change and then primarily focus around the last week of Jesus life on earth but just to be annoying As we reach this climax, we're going to press pause on John and come back to it next year. So um, we're going to take a bit of a break for the rest of the year. Uh, After next week, we're going to take a break from John and uh, we'll come back to it in 2023. And instead, we will spend some time in the Psalms. So just signaling that that's coming up. But right now, here we are, 
leaning into, coming into this climactic point in John. And in this passage that we're looking at, there's several themes mixed in. There's the theme of God's timing. There's the theme of God's glory. There's the theme of believing in Jesus. They're all kind of wrapped around one another, kind of like a rope. You know, the strands running through the passage. And in order to kind of see these themes come out to the fore, I've picked out what I've called four important announcements. Four important announcements in this passage. And so, kids, if you're trying to uh, if you're trying to pay attention, if you're trying to keep notes, see if you can pick up these four important announcements that I'm going to talk about. So we're going to look at the first 16 verses where we'll find our first important announcement. These first 16 verses will start with setting the scene. There's Lazarus, Martha, Mary, Jesus, and um, they're all friends of Jesus. Jesus gets word that one of his friends is sick. So uh, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, they're all siblings. They're a brother and two sisters. And Lazarus was sick. This was pretty dire. And unlike us, when we fall sick, it's kind of just an inconvenience. But for many people back in, uh, the, back in the day, before the invention of modern medicine, any sickness was a possibility of facing death. But Lazarus is so sick that they suspect that he's going to die. And that's why they've sent for Jesus. They, they, uh, they send Jesus, send for Jesus saying, come and visit him, essentially. Um, but Jesus says something amazing. When Jesus heard that he was sick, Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. And this is, the, this is the first important announcement right here. No, it is for God's glory, so that the God's Son may be glorified through it. This is an important announcement. That this sickness is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. There's something going on here that's more than just the natural progression of life while people get sick and they die. No, Jesus is saying, no, no, there's something important going on here. This is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified. And so on that basis, we're also told something else that's surprising. In the next few verses, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. So he loves Jesus, he loves Martha, um, he loves Lazarus. He knows that this sickness is going to lead to God's glory. So what does he do? He stays put. That just doesn't seem to compute in our normal kind of way of thinking. Lazarus is sick. This sickness leads to God's glory. Well, we better get going then, shouldn't we? We better better get going so that we can see this change. But no, he says, when he heard Lazarus was sick and because he loved them, he stayed put for two days. We think in terms of uh, time frames and crises and like uh, we've, got a, we've got our deadlines that need to be met. And when, when things happen, when crises happen, it, it kind of overwhelms us and uh, it consumes us. And we can't think of anything else. We can't do anything else. And we think, God, we need you to act now. We need change to happen now. We want, we want to see you at work here right now. But Jesus' timing and God's timing is not our timing. And you can see this once again uh, come to the fore in the way that the disciples respond. Uh, They say, why should we go back to Judea? Last time we were there, um, we were threatened with being stoned. Jesus says it's time to go back, but the disciples aren't sure. (laughs) The timing doesn't seem right to them. Don't you know that basically they will kill us if we go back, or at least they'll try again? But Jesus answered in verse 9, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. 
Now, we need to understand something here. You know, Jesus says, are there not 12 hours of daylight? He's talking in a way that uh, we, we probably don't quite grasp because our forensic Western minds go, well, sometimes there's 12 hours of daylight, sometimes there's less, sometimes there's more. But Jesus, isn't, Jesus lives in a world where they don't have a forensic view of a time that's based on the, uh, the, the frequency of a cesium atom that... That's how we define a second, is on, based on the frequency of a cesium atom. This, Jesus isn't thinking in those kind of contexts. He's talking to the people who are in front of him, who, think, who, who basically categorize hours by the daylight. So no matter what time the sun came up or went down, an hour was a twelfth of that time. It was divided into twelve parts. And so, in theory, the hour would be longer or shorter at different times of the year. So there was always twelve hours of daylight. And, but Jesus isn't making a point about time. I'll just tell you that to explain why he says there's 12 hours of daylight. But, but Jesus is making this comment to highlight the fact that there's time and place for things. There's time allotted for the tasks at hand. If you want to walk around in a time before streetlights and, and, and battery-powered torches, you do it during the day because that's when you can see. And so Jesus is saying, This is the time. This is the time for going back to Judea. It seems strange that Jesus was heading back into the hornet's nest, but now was the time for it. It was the proper time, just like the proper time for walking around is at daytime. And Jesus explains further, not only is now the right time, but it's time that we go and wake him up. And the disciples are a bit confused. They don't understand. What do you mean go and wake him up? If he's asleep... Well, that's probably a good sign. It means that he's getting the rest that he needs to overcome his illness. Don't worry, we don't need to go and risk our lives if he's just asleep. But they've misunderstood that Jesus is referring to, to death. He, saw, he told them plainly in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Can you imagine saying that to your friends? I was glad that I let my friend die so that you may believe. So that you may believe. I'm glad that Jesus wasn't there on that day because what happened next helped us believe here, so many years removed. In the end, Jesus... His, the way that what he's doing, the choices that he's making, the ministry that he is working in, is, is not just about the surface level things that are going on around him. And we've seen this time and time again with John. He, Jesus is doing something much deeper and more powerful than what just appears on the surface. Here, what he's doing is for our belief, and that is a good thing. Next, in our, in our next section, verses 12, uh, 17 to 27, Jesus turns up to... Bethany, just outside Jerusalem, four days after Lazarus has died. And so just if there was a question about whether or not Lazarus was dead, he's four days dead. He hasn't just kind of lapsed into a coma, he is dead. And a mourning crowd has gathered, they're spending time with the family, probably relatives and friends who travelled to mourn as a, as a, in terms of a funeral. And Je- as Jesus arrives to the family home, the town where they lived, Martha comes out to meet Jesus and she basically says, you're late. If, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. As, uh, as Carl pointed out, we have these ups and these downs and here we see Martha in the midst of her distress and mourning saying, Lord, you could have stopped this. You could have changed the outcome. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, she follows up. She's not not trying to be rude. (laughs) She's saying, she's kind of stating a fact. And so she follows up and says, look, I still still know that you are God. You're from God. Uh, I still know that you have God's blessing. And Jesus responds to her saying, look, your brother will rise again. But Martha misunderstands this as a reference to the future resurrection. She knows, yes, I know, he will rise again in the future. But Jesus wants to take her eyes off the future 
resurrection of all the future resurrection of the dead and he wants to draw her eyes to have faith in himself and so he says to her i am the resurrection and the life taking her eyes off that future day that they are hoping for with the resurrection of the dead and draws her eyes to himself I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And he asks her for a response of faith. Do you believe this? This is a wonderful revelation that that Jesus is the one through whom the resurrection will take place. It's not just some far distant thing. The power of resurrection, the one who brings life is standing there right in front of her. The one who actually had the world created through him is standing right in front of her. And Jesus calls her to put her faith and trust in him for that resurrection, for that life. And and Martha makes an amazing confession. She says, yes, Lord. She replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. I believe And this, and sorry, I missed the second important announcement. I forgot to tell you kids that we, uh, that the second important announcement was the statement, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, which is what Jesus says. That's a huge announcement. And here we have Martha responding to that. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. So Martha is connecting these two things together. She sees that the one, the Messiah who's come into the world is the one, the resurrection and the life. She sees that the Jesus is the one that they had been hoping for, the Christ. And especially important for uh, the people of Jesus' day, when the witness and testimony of women wasn't held in high regard, especially in a legal sense, here we have John recording that this was not just a man's game, that this was... Uh, this was a woman recognizing that Jesus was the Messiah. She was being able to recognize and receive Jesus just like anybody else. Martha recognized and put her faith and trust in him. Now, she might not have realized yet what was about to happen, but she did recognize that Jesus was the one sent by God. But I wondered. How would you respond if this question is asked of you today? Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, come into the world? Perhaps you see this as a nice story. But it is more than just a nice story. It is more than that. Here is a call from God to you down through the ages, through thousands of years to you this very day to call you. Will you believe in him? Will you trust in him? Will you look to him for life and resurrection instead of some vague hope of the future? Our hope of the future is centered in Jesus Christ. He is where we find life. And if you believe in him, you shall not die. Even though you die, you shall live You shall live, you shall have eternal life. In our third section, in verses 28 to 37, Martha tells Mary that Jesus has arrived, so she heads back into into town and says, look, Jesus is here, he'd like to talk to you. Mary rushes out of the house, and there's like a group of people who've come to mourn with them, and they go with her, thinking, oh, she's off to the the tomb, she's off to the graveside to to mourn. Uh, And people have thought that potentially... There might have been some mourners for hire. There was, there was a thing back in those days when you had a funeral, you would hire a, a crowd of mourners to go and mourn with you. But whoever is in this crowd, the point is that they go with Jesus. Uh, sorry, they go with Mary as, as witnesses to what's about to happen. And Mary brings the same complaint that Martha had brought. You're late. does she say Lord if you had been here my brother would not have died she sees the finality of death of the fact that her brother is lost is gone many of us have experienced that ourselves where we've experienced family members or friends 
who are gone. Or even um, those that we love very dearly. We know the finality of death, and here Mary is faced with it. And she says, you could have changed this. But she is stuck thinking that it's all over. It's all done with. And so they cry. She is quite upset. She is weeping. And amazingly, we see what Jesus does in verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Jesus has this response to seeing Mary in, in, in such anguish. Seeing the crowd crying and weeping as well, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And what exactly this is meant by this, there's a little bit of speculation around it, and people love to put their own spin on what they think Jesus was, was crying about or, or responding to. But I think based on the passage, we can see that the, the most natural reading is that Jesus is saddened by the effect of death on those around him and their loss. He was saddened and empathized with those who were mourning. And he himself was a friend of Lazarus. He loved Lazarus. And this deeply moved, this being troubled, it's kind of it's almost like an an agitation or an indignation. It there's almost a strain of anger to it in his response to this weeping. That Jesus is agitated about sin and death and its effects in the world. And, and he responds to it with these powerful words. In verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus had an outpouring of emotion. Now, we're, we live in a world that is... Um, uh, we have rivers of sentimentality and... Uh, we kind of naturally kind of, this probably doesn't surprise us. But if we take ourselves out of our own kind of mindset for a while and put ourselves back in that ancient Near Eastern context and remember that this is God himself and he knew what was about to happen and what he was about to do. He knew the plans that he had for the long run in terms of him bringing the resurrection of the dead. But still, but still he expressed his emotion as a man Weeping at the at the graveside, Jesus wept despite knowing what was about to happen. He he wept over the power of death and sin in humanity. And then we get yet a third comment on the lateness of Jesus. The Jews said, "Oh, how he loved him!" But some of them said, "Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying?" If only Jesus had been here, he could have sorted this out. He was late. We bemoan the losses around us and we see the things that happen around us and we go, why God? Why didn't you heal this person that we loved and we cared for? Well, God, why didn't you stop this disaster that has come upon us? Lord, why haven't you overthrown this tyrant in the world? God's time frame is not our time frame. God's ways are higher than our ways. But nevertheless, he sympathizes with us. He knows our frame. He has walked among us. He has experienced the human life. And he walks with us in our suffering. And he walks with us in our suffering for a, a future, a future where God's glory is revealed, which is what we come to in our next passage. But once again, I forgot to tell you what was the important announcement the important announcement was that Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. So we come to our fourth section, verses 38 to 44. Jesus still deeply moved. Once again, it reiterates that. 
They ask him, they ask to take, so he asks them to take away the stone. They protest. Look, he's been dead for a while. This is the Middle East, um, uh, Palestine. There's probably going to be an odor. The body's probably started to decompose. It's nice that you want to kind of come and have like a bit of an open casket situation, see him gaze on him for the last time, but probably not advisable. At least that's the way that they were thinking. But Jesus presses for them to do it and for Mary to have faith, to believe that she would see the glory of God. In verse 40, then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? Jesus isn't asking her to have a blind faith. They're asking for her to have a real faith in Jesus, whom they already know has displayed the power of God, whom they already know is from God. And so saying, have more faith in me because you've you've already seen what has come before. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they take away the stone and Jesus takes this moment to pray which is, again, a bit surprising. You're not expecting they take away the stone and Jesus starts praying. But this is our fourth important announcement, our fourth important announcement. In verse 41, Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I thank you that you have heard me. Jesus had confidence that the Father would hear his prayer. And we might take this for granted. Oh, Jesus is God's son. Of course, that's going to happen. But but Jesus says this so that we may know, so the people around him might know that what he is doing, he's doing at the Father's behest. He's doing in relationship with the Father. He's doing uh, by asking the Father. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. He shows that this is for the benefit of those who are listening because it's for them to believe In verse 42, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. This isn't Jesus working by himself. He's working in concert with the Father. And this prayer was to help them believe. Do you see how this idea of believing in Jesus has wound all the way through this passage? Believing in Jesus, the glory of God in his own time frame. This prayer was to help them believe that Jesus was sent from God. He's pointing back to God the Father while he's about to accomplish this amazing miracle, which is what he does next in verse 43 and 44. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And I've I've, I've put the ESV verses uh, translation of these verses up because I think it puts it really well. The man who died came out with his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a linen with a cloth Jesus said to them unbind him and let him go this is astonishing the dead man came out this isn't like um you know our our tv dramas where they kill off a character and then they bring them back a few seasons later oh they didn't really die or Uh, like a video game where you have a certain number of lives where you can come back again and again and again. This, This is powerful because there was no answer. They thought it was final. They thought it was done for. They thought, no, we're not going to see Lazarus again, at least for not a very long time. He's gone. And here is Jesus saying, Lazarus, come out. And this man rises from the dead. I, I don't know. Some of you kids probably have lost pets. But you can't speak to your pet and say, come back to life. And they jump up and start running around again. Death is is final. They're gone. But here is Jesus who undoes death. Lazarus, come out. And he came out. And though he was bound in his grave clothes, Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. It's amazing. And it represents what we are like. We are like the man in the grave, in the tomb, bound up in our grave clothes. We are dead spiritually. And one day we will be dead physically. And we need a resurrecting power to come through Jesus to wake us up from the grave, to bring us forth. We can't just just lift ourselves out of the grave. 
You can't say to a dead man, wake up. And he goes, oh, yes, I've decided now is a good time to wake up. No, we need the, the life-giving power of the voice of God to speak and to make things come into existence, to bring us back to life. We can have confidence that when Jesus promises to bring his people back to life, it will happen because he's shown us in Lazarus that he can do it. And he does it in Lazarus in a kind of a foretaste way because Lazarus himself will one day die again. But Jesus is giving us a promise of eternal life where the natural causes of death will no longer assail us. We will have life eternally. And Jesus, we can also have confidence, not only because we've seen Jesus do it, but we can have confidence because Jesus has the ear of the Father. Jesus speaks to the Father. Jesus is one with the Father. The Father hears him. And so when Jesus says, I'm going to do this for you, we can say, great, he's going to deliver because he is with God the Father and, and God listens to him. We look forward to the day that Jesus will call us forth from our graves and say, unbind her, let her go. Unbind him, let him go. And yet even now, we hope for this in terms of our physical bodies, but even now, we have had some kind of resurrection with God. We have been resurrected and it's symbolized in our baptisms as we rise out of the waters of baptism that we have risen from death and we are made alive with Jesus Christ. And Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2 where he lays out this wonderful picture. Because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is amazing good news that even now we are raised and seated with Christ because Christ has been risen and because we are one with him, we are seated and secured with him. We have found a resurrection for our, for our souls, a resurrection for our lives, even while we wait for the fullness of that to take root in our physical bodies. We have been saved through the grace of God, not of ourselves. We've been brought to life. So let's just recap where we got, we've gone as we close things off. We've seen... We've seen God's timing for God's glory, even if it means pain. We've seen that uh, Jesus is the source of life and resurrection. We've seen that Jesus has walked and the walk and talked the talk as a man. He's experienced life. He's experienced the pain and frustration and anger at death and sin. But he acts to rescue. And Jesus is the one who does rescue raise us up he is the one who does rescue us because he is heard by the father and even now we have that secured for us with christ who has risen from the dead and we have experienced that newness of life in him as we wait for the fullness of that to take effect in creation let's thank our god for this and then turn to participate with jesus christ together in the Lord's Supper as we remember and celebrate him and what he has done for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, the, for sending Jesus Christ into the world, the, the sent one of God, the one who is one with you. We thank you that he is the resurrection and the life, the one through whom we can have eternal life and never die. Lord, help us to put our faith and trust in him to rest in him despite the, the difficulties that we face now with the ups and downs, with the suffering and the trials, uh, with the things that we look around us and we ask, Lord, why you haven't changed them or done something about them. But Lord, help us to trust you in the midst of those, to rest in you as we look towards that eternal life. We thank you, Lord, that even now we have experienced being raised to life with Jesus Christ because he has already secured our lives. And we look forward, Lord, to the resurrection of the dead where we will never die. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.